become interested in gerontology? Great question. Uh, and what I love to tell students about. It was a mentor. It was someone when I was, I was not an undergraduate. As an undergraduate, my interest had more to do. I'm a sociologist. And I went on to grad school because I thought I was going to become the head of Planned Parenthood World Federation. So my interest was in teens and pregnancy and women's reproductive rights. And I got to Cornell where I went to graduate school specifically to get a PhD to become that head. And I had an absolutely wonderful professor, Gordon Stribe, who's a very famous so, uh, social gerontologist, who said, you know something? I know you like dealing with women's reproductive health, but here's an area where we need people. In the future, we will need people, so think about it. And I had never taken a course in gerontology. They didn't have courses in gerontology when I was an undergraduate. We weren't as lucky as you. So Gordon Stribe himself took me under his wing and started to teach me about gerontology. And then he had me become a teaching assistant in his class at Cornell. And that's how I got interested in it. So a good mentor. Can you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist and at what point in your career did you embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? Okay, that's a great, it's a great question and then you want an on honest answer, right? Yes. So I would tell you I'm going to start with your last part of your question first and go backwards. I don't speak of myself as a gerontologist very often. Uh, certainly I do when people are asking me, so what's your field of, you know, what's your interest? I talk, I'm a gerontologist within sociology. I do speak about myself as a sociologist whose interest is in gerontology. So I want to make that, that's the honest, I want to give you the honest answer. And, and it probably has something to do with my career trajectory, which was your first question. So here I am, I'm at Cornell. I get my PhD, my dissertation is still on my reproductive area because that's where I had started all of this. Not on my reproductive area, but on, on women's reproductive health. Uh, and so I was taking courses there, but at the same time this parallel track with Gordon Stribe, dealing with aging, beginning to look at the literature on that. When I went out looking for jobs, um, which would have been in the late 70s, early 80s, there really were no jobs. And I know you all face you know, similar issues, but back then we were really in a trough in terms of were there academic jobs. I found one job, and, and this is the honest truth about how I ended up being a gerontologist or a social gerontologist. I found one job available in a 50-mile radius from where my husband, who was also a professor, found a job. And that job, was they were so smart, they were looking for a sociologist who could start a gerontology program. And I said, here I am, here I am. Uh, and, and that started what became my life's career. So when I got this job at Quinnipiac, I've been at Quinnipiac for my entire career, which is amazing to think about, 35 years. And nobody at Quinnipiac would feel bad if I said this. I intended to take this job because it was the only job in the area and then move on. I said, this is a, this is a school that I've never been prepared for. I come from, obviously, an R1. I come from big universities. Uh, and this was a tiny little college of 2000. And I said, this is not what I've been prepared for. I've been prepared to do research. I've never been taught how to teach. Um, so I'll take this because it's here, and then I'll move on. I took the job, and I have to tell you, and I hope this happens to you, OK? Erica, I took it, and from I'll say a month in, I just sort of said, I'm never looking back. This is for me. It turns out I'm a teacher. Um, yes, I do lots of research because I have to and because I like to. But 
For me, teaching young people and getting them excited about aging and getting them excited about sociology became my life's work. So I moved. As soon as I was there at Quinnipiac, I was teaching. I had four courses. Keep this in mind as you go out there and look. Four courses each semester. And I was developing the gerontology program. So I would say the first 10 years of my career at Quinnipiac were so devoted to learning how to teach, learning how to be a mentor to these undergraduates who had no intention of going on to graduate school. These were not the students that I had taught as a TA at Cornell. They were not the students who I had gone to school with at University of Pennsylvania. They were students who were going to, they were first generation. They were going to college because today you needed, or at that point, you needed a college degree. Their parents had not gone to school. So I learned in those 10 years how to be a teacher to those students, not to the students, uh, the student I had been. At the same time I developed this program, and that's when I met or found Aggie. I had no idea what I was doing. So Gordon Stribe, who was my mentor in all of this, he couldn't help me because he never developed a program in gerontology, and he didn't know my students. He knew Cornell students. So I turned to the one organization that actually wanted to help me to develop a program for the kinds of students I was working with. And that turned out to be Aggie. I had never heard of it. No one ever told me about it. I think there was no, remember, there was no internet. So I found out about it through some research in the library. Here is this organization. I went to my first meeting. That's another place where I walked in. I said, you know, I'll do this once. Maybe it'll help me. I met people like Suzanne Kunkel. Uh, and I said, I never looked back. I said, this is my organization because these people are teachers. Yes, they're researchers. Yes, they do many other things, but they're teachers. So with Aggie's help, I developed this program, which went from 1984. We, we got our gerontology degree and until the present. And it grew tremendously, and then it has slacked off. So we're like every other gerontology, well, almost every other gerontology program. Um, the beauty of being at a school like Quinnipiac, it's small enough, even though it's grown from its 2000, it's small enough that they don't really, they're not looking to see how many students you have. They want to know what is innovative. Are you doing something innovative? And gerontology in the state of Connecticut was innovative. We are the only bachelor's level. Uh, there are quasi, there is one uh, master's level. Uh, there were certificate programs. We had Yale down the road, you know, we have all of this, but we were the only bachelor's level. So again, my, my career in gerontology was learning how to teach to the students, learning how to engage them in gerontology. And here I get to the end of my career, uh, 35 years later, being very proud of what still exists at Quinnipiac. It's still a very strong program. Um, and looking to the next phase of my life to be more, even more, of a mentor in gerontology. Did you have female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology? And who are they? And what's unique about being a woman gerontologist? That's a great, I love that question. No one has ever asked me that question. They've asked me the other questions. And it just gives me the ability, and this is where the tissues come in, it gives me the ability to talk about the people, oh dear, <laughs> Who made a difference? OK, so here I am. I'm teaching at Quinnipiac. I've now been there for 10 years. I had, as I said to you, I had to concentrate on learning how to teach well, developing this program. And I realized that one thing I had left behind, despite doing one or two pedagogical articles, I had left my research behind. 10 years into being at Quinnipiac, I was already a full professor. I was already tenured. Mm -hmm. Ten, you have a 10-year window. You all do this right away. Back then, we did not do it in the same way, uh, or we, many of us didn't. Postdocs were, for sociologists, that was not a normal track. But I said, you know what? It would be wonderful to get back into research. I'm going to try and do a postdoc. Now, who would I do this with? 
Now, I don't know if I've ever said this to anyone, and uh, Linda knows it, okay, but, but so I thought, who would I love to do a postdoc with where I could learn more about gerontology, learn more about what I'm interested in, which is family relationships. Um, notice I talked to you when you asked me about my career, I talked about the teaching part. I didn't talk about the research part because for so long the teaching was so, uh, it had such pri high priority. So I said, my interest has always been, the, the two prongs of my research have been in grandparent-grandchild relationships uh, and also later, in later years, Alzheimer's and family relationships within uh, families where there is a, a person with Alzheimer's. Um, so I was interested in the family, interested in gerontology, interested in Alzheimer's, I'm sorry, interested in grandparents. I said, now where would I get some real mentorship. I had just seen an article in the newspaper which featured Lisa Weifer, and she was talking about her, um, she had a support, she had just started the family support group for Alzheimer's. I said, God, that would be fascinating. I would love to do that. It's down in North Carolina. I could bring my whole family. The kids would love it. She wrote back, honest woman that she is, and said, I can't have a postdoc because that is not my position in the university at Duke. She said, but I'm going to send you to somebody who can and somebody you're going to love. And that was Linda George. So do I have women as mentors? Absolutely. So I was very lucky. Linda George said, I might have been the happiest person on the phone she ever heard when she called up to say, you got the postdoc. I think I jumped out of, the, you know, out of my skin, which is my way. Um, and I could already, I mean, Linda is this, she's an amazing mentor. So I had Linda George, and I made sure, and they made sure, not only Linda was my mentor at Duke, but I had Lisa as well, even though in, you know, down on paper, de jure, she couldn't be my mentor, she was my mentor. I went to as many things with Lisa as I did with Linda many conferences, and a third person who herself had been a postdoc just before and who now worked with Linda and with Lisa, Debbie Gold. So I have this triumvirate of women who are these strong, incredibly bright, incredibly engaged, incredibly fun people in the field of gerontology. Why wouldn't I become, right, someone, why wouldn't I emulate them and become as much like them as I could. I took the best of each. They all are just, you know, they have very different skills. And, and all three of them, not but, and all three of them couldn't be more supportive. And I hope you have that because Erica, that made all the difference. So Debbie would sit with me with the publications that I was trying to get out and I had no idea what I was doing. And again, I'd written pedagogical things. I'd never written research-based things since my dissertation. And she sat with me and worked with me. And when I got an R&R &R and I was going, okay, so that means they don't want me. She goes, no, an R&R &R actually means you should keep going on this. I thought, oh, I always thought an R&R &R was just a nice way of saying we reject you, okay? That's how little of mentoring I had before in this, in this avenue, okay? And Lisa would take me on her. She'd go off into the um, countryside in North Carolina uh, talking about Alzheimer's, going to her community support groups, and I'd go with her because I'm, I'm very engaged in the community. And part of our program at Quinnipiac is um, a wonderful uh, town gown kind of a liaison uh, kind of thing. And then Linda, Linda who just knows all of it and, and just, she, she got me involved in everything at GSA. She could not have been more you know, helpful in introducing me. I still remember, and maybe this is your experience, but I remember going with all of them to my first GSA meeting and, or maybe it was, yeah, it must have been my first, and they wouldn't let me alone. I kept saying, no, it's time for me to go back upstairs, and they'd say, no, I want you to meet this person, I want you to meet this person, I want you to meet this person. That's what a mentor does. Listens to what's of interest to you, also pushes a little bit when I'm, 
you know I can talk. You've now heard me, right? You know I can talk. But I'm also not very comfortable when it comes to if I think someone has a great amount of knowledge that I don't know, um, I tend to be really quiet. Debbie used to kid me and say, you know, this is Lynn Hodgson and she'll probably bow down a couple times before she understands she doesn't need to do that. And it really was true. It, it was said in jest and it was said in love, um, but she was right. So they made sure that I felt as an equal. I was a tenured full professor. Um, it wasn't like I was 18 anymore. And even if I had been 18, they would have done the same thing because I've watched them do the same thing with their own undergraduate and their own graduate students. So they're good that way. They treat us all exactly the same. Is there anything unique about being a woman, Jerry? Okay, that's right. That was a part of the question. Again, you want honesty. It would be so easy for me to say uh, yes, being a woman set me apart because I was, um, people didn't treat me the same or something like that. I can't say that. I remember being at a very early Augie meeting. I can even remember her name. I can't remember what I ate this morning, but I can remember this woman's name from 20 years ago, 25 years. Her name was Ruth Wegg. She was also a gerontologist from the West Coast. She was president of Augie at that time, and she got up and she made allusion to, and she was obviously one generation removed from me. And she made allusion to the fact that what a hard time it had been for her as a woman, as a soci, I believe she was a sociologist, I may be wrong, she might have been a psychologist, but as someone trying to move up in the profession and trying to become a professor and a full professor. And I remember sitting there thinking, I haven't experienced that. And my reaction was, and this is an honest reaction, Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, because I didn't have to experience it because you experienced it. And, and so have I ever felt, I also think, let's, let's be honest, Erica, we're in a, in a discipline in gerontology that should be all embracing. And also, gerontology is, if you'll pardon me, all about older women. So uh, the truth of the matter is I have not ever felt set apart because I was a woman. The only thing I might feel is a little bit sad for those who are older men in gerontology because we're always talking about older women. So while I am not being a Pollyanna and I am not pretending that um, you know we're female chauvinists in any way, I am laughing at the notion. I, I do remember Gordon Stribe making a comment about how he, the, the women with whom he paired in research, uh, Ethel Shannis, um, Bernice Newgarden, people like that, he did make allusion to the fact that he was one of the few men. This is a, an area of life uh, or an area of endeavor where actually women had opportunities that they perhaps did not have. So I was lucky enough to be that next generation as opposed to the one that had to blaze its way. You. I mean, hopefully that is not an issue for you anymore. I do recognize that it isn't gone. Um, it's like, you know, we all talk about now that we have Obama, is racism gone? Well, of course not. But, and we, we know we have to keep working and keep vigilant. But I was lucky enough not to, to experience that. No professor of mine, and when you say, I, I think about this at Cornell, um, I do know that women professors at Cornell, who are a generation ahead of me, had a tough time trying to become full professors. But my generation, uh, and none of my professors ever said, you can't do this. You need to go into a family sociology field because there's no way you could go into an economic or political sociology or something like that. So I no. I never felt that. How has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? <laughs> That's wonderful. Who thought of that question? <laughs> that is a marvelous, marvelous question. And I'll, I'll start with an anecdote right from the last few days. And since not everybody will see this, or not perhaps a lot of people will see this, they won't see themselves in what I'm about to say. I came here and I explained to my colleagues here and friends that I am going to retire at the end of this year. And 
asked me that question, and this is a perfect illustration, I thought that because I am a gerontologist, because I am a, a social a sociologist who studies this, I was prepared to hear my colleagues congratulations, um, what, you know, you, what, what's the next phase going to look like, how exciting you're doing this in health, you're doing it at a time when you can you know, still enjoy things. Instead, I actually got from many people, I described it to somebody as anger. Um, I got, what? <laughs> why would you do that? And I said, well, and I explained why. And so my comment is, we who are in geron the gerontological field need to actually pay attention to what we teach. I think the, the anger and surprise had more to do with people feeling threatened themselves, that they might be older than I am and still working and saying we have to do this. Um, so. Being in gerontology has been one of the best, or knowing about aging, Erica, and it's why I encourage younger folks to go into this. It has helped tremendously all along the way. But here's an anecdote of me coming to a, an Aggie meeting, expecting to be embraced by this warmth that you don't see out in the, in the other part of the world. You know, let them go, really? What are you doing? Uh, and instead, people weren't listening to what they teach, which is when somebody's ready to retire, that's actually a good thing. Um, congratulate them that they've made a, a hard decision. I've been a teacher my whole life. Um, so being in this field has helped. And you didn't ask this. You asked, I think, about sort of how in my life. But I will tell you that it has helped tremendously with my own family. So. I'm a very lucky individual. I have the best genes of anybody I know. And I'm not talking about the ones I'm wearing. I'm talking about the fact that I have, I had four grandparents. I, that's what, remember I said to you, scratch a gerontologist, and you're probably gonna find somebody who had a relationship with grandparents or an older person. So I had four grandparents who lived until I was 40 years old. And they all four lived until I was 35. Until I was 40, I had grandparents. That's where I began writing about grandparents and older grandchildren. Because I would look at the literature and nobody would talk about the fact that there were grandchildren who were actually old. I mean, older. I already had children and I had all my grandparents. So it was, nobody was speaking to that. And so I went into that. But it also allowed me to step back in many ways to deal with many of the issues related to my grandparents as they aged, my parents who both lived. My dad is still living at 94. Uh, my mom just died. She was 91. But to deal with all of that, I would tell people and have told people in community presentations, in university presentations, if you want to pick a discipline an area of specialization within whatever field that will somehow meld your, your work and your, your personal life, um, this is the one to choose. Because it has helped me all along the way. I've become the de facto person everybody turns to in the family, not because I have the knowledge, but because I'm smart enough to know who to call. If I want to, I call Lisa Gwyther up and say, OK, you're the social worker who deals with caregiving. This is my situation. Who will you call in my area? If I'm dealing with something to do with sibling issues, I talk to Debbie and say, OK, you've looked at this for how many years? What do you think about what I should do? Or osteoporosis. I love this. Here's a wonderful example, OK? Oh, I love talking about this. So. I come from a, a long line of very old women, right, who have lived into old age. They all have had osteoporosis. Debbie Gold, one of my mentors, that she is the, you know, she's the social guru of osteoporosis. I have sent all of my family to Debbie Gold. So the point is, my work life and my home life um, 
have melded very, very nicely. It's been a great, it's a great discipline. I often wonder, and don't tell anybody I said this, I often wonder what mathematicians, chemists, I mean, what do they then, when they go home, do they, do they have any application of this in their home lives? And it sounds probably very parochial of me in that I don't know enough about math and I don't know enough about chemistry, and I'm sure they do. But I sit here and say, me, I, I live what I teach. And I told you that one of the, the areas of research that I have followed for 30 years and written about for 30 years is grandparenting. And I just became a grandparent, so why wouldn't I? In fact, can I tell you a funny story? Okay. So everybody has a story about when their child tells them they are going to become a grandparent, right? So my son and my daughter-in-law came to visit us. We all met in New York City. They handed, me, they handed my husband and I a present. We opened it up, and it was a book that said baby boomer grandparents or something like that. And I said, that's wonderful, you're helping me with my research. I thought they had found a book for my research. And they looked at me, and my husband tapped me on the head and he said, this is for both of us. Do you think they might be trying to tell us something? And I sort of went, oh, I got it. Oh my God, I'm gonna become a grandmother. So everything fits together very, very nicely in my life. I'm very lucky. The Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. So within that framework, is there anything else you'd like us to know about legacy? I think this is what I would say, and I've never thought about it this way, especially since I was the one who asked Pam if I was going to be interviewing somebody else. <laughs> uh, what I would tell new people in the field, and especially new women in the field, just what you asked before, here is, a, here is a discipline that combines the best of our, our intelligence, our minds, our creativity, and the best of, of our desire to also perhaps have a family, have a relationship. I don't care if it's a family. It could be a relationship or, or work out in the community. I mean, when people ask me, what it is I will be doing, my comment is I'm not going to be doing something different. I'm still going to work in the community. Ma, you want to hear what I'm going to do? This is my legacy. This is what gerontology's legacy is to me. Forget about my legacy to gerontology. My husband and I listened to what I have learned all these years. We bought, we are downsizing to a very small apartment in New York City. And I know people go, New York City, older people, it's perfect. Okay, a small apartment, but do you know why we bought, where we bought, besides the fact it might be the only place we could afford? Um, because in the first floor of this very large complex, they have something called Project Open. And what it is, is a, an agency to age in place. And so what I'm gonna do with the next phase of my life is exactly what I've been doing with this phase. I'm gonna go down and work in that project, because I'm not yet at the stage I need the help, I'll work by talking about grandparenting, helping people who need help. And so that's the legacy of gerontology to me, and it is hopefully my legacy to gerontology. I don't have the advantage of having students like you, Eric. I don't have graduate students. I have undergraduates who now populate all of the aging services in Connecticut, and I have told every single one of them, save a place for me, okay? So if you're working in an assisted living, save a room here. If you're somebody who's working in care management, save a room, um, or, or save a, you know, a, a portion of your day for me so you can help me with that. That's my legacy in that sense, but I think of it more globally. I think of the fact, what is it that I can still give? My legacy is that I still want to give. I've learned that from being a gerontologist.